All right, guys. It is a spectacularly gorgeous, over-the-top beautiful moonlit night here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here on Monday, May 29th, 2023, where the little dog and I are wrapping up our first opening weekend of... Uh, being a super host here at Bugs in a Jar Farm, I'm expecting a call, yeah, right, from support about some uh, clueless moron claiming she got bed bugs <laughs> at Bugs in a Jar Farm. And that is another rant for another day on another channel. This is Collapse Chronicles, so we're going to... Uh, not talk about bugs in a jar farm and the uh, pitfalls of being a super host, but we're going to go look at the collapse of, uh, well, I guess the collapse of the bottom of the ocean will be the main thing, but before we do, since uh, there's still some confusion, I think, about what the collapse of the bottom of the ocean is all about, it's about overpopulation. It's about too many people on this planet. Uh, so, as I always do, I'm going to kick off this rant with a couple of quotes about overpopulation. I like this short and sweet one from President... Uh, President, no, we're going to skip over James Madison's, although I do like his. What did Ralph Waldo Emerson, who died in 1882, I like his quip, if government knew how, I should like to see it check, not multiply the population. That was when the population was, what, one-sixth what it is now. But we're going to hear from uh, <clears throat> John Stuart Mill, philosopher John Stuart Mill, who died in 1873. Not real familiar with, I recognize the name, but I like this guy a lot. So this is what he had to say back when the population was one-fifth or one-sixth of what it is today. <clears throat> Take it away, John Stuart Mill. There is room in the world, no doubt, and even in old countries, for a great increase in population, supposing the arts of life to go on improving and capital to increase. But even if innocuous, I confess I see very little reason for desiring it. The density of population necessary to enable mankind to obtain, in the greatest degree, all the advantages both of cooperation and of social intercourse, has, in all the most populous countries, been attained. A population may be too crowded, though all be amply suffied amply supplied with food and raiment. <clears throat> it is not good for man to be kept perforce at all times in the presence of his species. A world from which solitude is extirpated is a very poor ideal. Solitude, in the sense of being often alone, is essential to any depth of meditation or of character, and solitude in the presence of natural beauty and grandeur is the cradle of thoughts and aspirations which are not only good for the individual, but which society could ill do without. Nor is there much satisfaction in contemplating the world with nothing left to 
the spontaneous activity of nature with every root of land brought into cultivation which is capable of growing food for human beings. Every flowery waste or natural pasture plowed up. All quadrupeds or birds which are not domesticated for man's use exterminated as his rivals for food. Every hedgerow or superfluous tree rooted out and scarcely a place left where a wild shrub or flower could grow without being eradicated as a weed in the name of improved agriculture. If the earth must lose that great portion of its pleasantness which it owes to things that the unlimited increase of wealth and population would extirpate from it for the mere purpose of an enabling it to support a larger but not a better or a happier population, I sincerely hope for the sake of posterity that they will content to be stationary long before necessity compels them to it. Thank you, John Stuart Mills for uh, phrasing what uh, my main article is going to be about. But uh, guys, I think you've been noticed how I have not mentioned the debt limit fight one time, but I have to I have to say this one. Uh, I can't resist this one from oilprice.com. Hmm. Where have we heard this before? New debt limit deal commits to speeding up energy projects. U.S. financial markets breathed a sigh of relief on Monday after negotiators from Democratic and Republican parties reached an agreement to raise the debt limit on Sunday night days before the government hit its borrowing limit. Uh, among its key provisions, the New Deal will make it easier for both, for both fossil fuel and renewable energy projects to get licenses. Wow! Can you say frying pan and the fire? Uh, even oilprice.com noticing how these, uh, these fossil fuel uh, planet eaters are now in bed with these green, clean energy renewable energy corporations, that they're no longer fighting, they are, you know, whatting each other. Uh, they have joined up. So uh, it is no longer a choice between the frying pan of fossil fuels or the fire of renewables. We're getting the frying pan and the fire compliments of Democrats and Republicans. It makes no difference who is uh, in charge of Congress or in the White House. Everybody is cheering on all of the above to take this planet to Venus. Yes. Uh, long advanced by Democratic Senator Joe Manchin. Yeah, right. He, he looks like a Republican, walks like a Republican, talks like a Republican. Democratic Senator Joe Manchin, my ass, of West Virginia. The new rules will basically streamline 
the environmental review process potentially getting projects off the ground faster. Yes, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, uh, you know, one of the biggest right-wingers uh, on the planet, House, you know, Republican House Speaker Kevin McCarthy says he has pledged to Joe Biden to continue working with the White House and Democrats, quote, because we need energy, all forms of energy, especially for our grid to double. We made a commitment that we are not stopping now. That would also deal with transmission. It would deal with pipelines and others. I had that conversation with the president yesterday and with the White House. So he had the conversation with Biden that uh, they are two peas out of the same pod. And then he talked to, uh, to the White House. So I see I have a message from uh, my vacation rental people that I'm halfway through this. But anyway, what was I really here to talk about? <clears throat> From the Washington Post, no less, we're going to talk about uh, the latest rant on deep sea mining, about how overpopulation and the all of the above energy uh, rush to supply too many people eating too much stuff is shaping up at the bottom of the ocean. Scientists detected 5,000 sea creatures nobody knew existed. It's a warning. Yes. Take it away, Washington Post. There are bright, gummy creatures that look like partially peeled bananas. Glassy, translucent sponges that cling to the seabed like chandeliers flipped upside down. Phantasmic octopuses. I thought it was octopi, named appropriately after Casper the Friendly Ghost. And that's just what's been discovered so far in the ocean's biggest hot spot for future deep sea mining to manufacture electric vehicles, batteries, and other key pieces of a low carbon economy. We need a lot of metal. Countries and companies are increasingly looking to mine that copper, cobalt, and other critical minerals from the seafloor. A new analysis of the Clarion Clipper Zone, a vast mineral rich area in the Pacific Ocean, estimates there are some 5,000 sea animal species completely new to science there. The research published Thursday in the journal Current Biology is the latest sign that underwater extraction may, may come at a cost hmm, to a diverse array of life that we are only beginning to understand. Uh, this is Douglas McCauley, ocean science professor at UC Santa Barbara who is not involved in the study, quote, this study really highlights how off the charts this section of our planet and this section of our ocean is in terms of how much life there is down there, close quote. It also underscores a conundrum, a conundrum of so-called clean energy, extracting the raw material needed to power the transition away from fossil fuels has its own environmental and human cost. Advocates for deep sea mining say the toll of getting those metals is at its lowest under the sea, away from people 
and even richer ecosystems on land. This is Ger Gerard Barron, chief executives of the uh, chief executive of the Metals Company, one of the leading firms aiming to mine the seafloor for metals. The Metals Company, that's a real original name for a planet eater. Quote, it just fundamentally makes sense that we look for where we can extract these metals with the lightest planetary touch. There you go, the CEO of a planet-eating corporation called the Metals Company talking about how his multinational corporation is looking for the lightest planetary touch. But the discovery of so much sea life reveals how little we know about Earth's oceans and how great the cost of renewable energy may be to life below the waves. Yes, at the bottom of the ocean, miles below the surface, is a potato. A bunch of potatoes, or more precisely, a bunch of rocks that look like potatoes. Yes, after a shark's tooth or clam shell descends the depths to the seafloor, layer upon layer of metallic elements dissolved in the seawater build up on those fragments of bone and stone over millions of years. The results are submarine fields of potato-sized mineral deposits called polymetallic nodules. For a society in need of those minerals, the nodules are unburied treasure sitting right there on the seafloor ready to be collected. Yes, and one of the biggest assemblages of nodules sits at the bottom of the clarion clipiter zone, a region twice the size of India, sandwiched between Mexico and Hawaii. Yes, despite decades of interest in mining this abyss, Little is known about the region's baseline biodiversity, so a team led by the Natural History Museum in London analyzed over 100,000 records from years of research cruises sampling sea creatures. Uh, the team found between 6,000 and 8,000 thousand animals with about 5,000 being completely new to science. One of the world's few remaining intact wildernesses, the extreme depths and darkness of the clarion clipper zone have fostered the evolution of some animals found nowhere else on earth. Uh, and then they talk some about some of these. I love the name of this one, the gummy squirrel, which is actually a sea cucumber. Uh, don't forget the Casper octopus, named for its ghostly white appearance. Uh, many animals find shelter in the nodules themselves. Tiny ragworms burrow into them while glass sponges grow out of them. Little is known about how any of these species interact and form ecosystems. It's a surprisingly high diversity environment. But don't forget the need for nodules. Okay, it's 2023, we've been around for 300,000 years, we have never needed these nodules until now. Until now. 300,000 years, we haven't needed these goddamn things, but to hell with the greatest intact wilderness on the planet, humans are going to the bottom of the ocean to get those nodules. 
the need for nodules, that biodiversity has led over 700 marine science and policy experts to call for a pause on mining approvals until sufficient and robust scientific information has been obtained. Too little is known, they say, about how mining may hurt, fish, may hurt fisheries, release carbon stored in the seabed, or put plumes of sediment into the water. Old underwater mining test sites show little sign of ecological recovery. Yes, uh, proponents of deep sea mining argue it comes with fewer ethical trade-offs than does land-based extraction. Deep in the ocean, there are no indigenous communities to move, no child labor to exploit, and no rainforest to raise. Yes. Uh, back to Baron of the Metals Company. You couldn't dream up a better place to put such a large abundant resource. resource. <clears throat> the company says it has designed its robotic vehicle to pick up nodules with as little sediment as possible, but even Barrett admits that it's a quote, bad day for any organism sucked up. This is not about zero impact, he said. I don't know of anything that has zero impact. Uh, I do know something that has zero uh, impact. That is a human being that has never been born. A human being that has never been born has an environmental footprint of exactly zero. Uh, and there you go. And then they talk about this bullshit about how this little bitty nation of Nauru, which is already an ecological sacrifice zone, is being used as a cover story by the medical metals company. Uh, taking advantage of this loophole to start in, uh, in the next couple of years. If all goes according to plan, the metals company expects to begin mining by late 2024 or early 2025. Opponents worry that is not enough time to make sure it can be done safely. Jackson said it is, quote, completely undecided about how we're going to oversee and enforce any of these regulations. That's a very live debate at the moment. So we have 939 comments, starting with Joe. Explain to me, please, how ripping up the ocean floor for electric vehicles and batteries that have no recycling strategy is compatible with principles of sound ecology. 338 thumbs up. Uh, anyway. Guys, it is the uh, frying pan and the fire. Uh, the frying pan and the fire, and get out there and enjoy your deep sea bed uh, while you still can. Anyway, I have to get back to this little drama going on with my uh, <coughs> rental company about my bed bug complaint. Does this ever end? Bye, guys.